I knew I was going to love this one, and I absolutely did. Dr. Jill Krista is an amazing human being. She is a naturopathic doctor, and she's a specialist in mold illness, Lyme disease, pans and pandas, which is the pediatric acute onset of neuropsychiatric symptoms or syndrome. So that could be, it's very sudden, and it comes on often after a strep throat or some kind of illness, but it's where children develop tics or they can have some kind of jerky movements, those kinds of things, or the mood, depression, anxiety, other kinds of OCD, things like that. And sometimes it's regressive behaviors too. So anyway, we talk a little bit about pans and pandas, but mostly we're talking about mold illness and how to know if your anxiety in particular, so if you have chronic anxiety, but also could be mood swings, irritability, feeling just like overwhelmed and anxious kind of all the time, even depressed, you might not even think of like real, like a depressive episode, but just feeling sad, weepy, feeling like you just can't get it together. And if you're sick, if you have injuries like sprained ankles or things like that frequently and just feel like you can, you're never really getting well, then I think mold illness is something you might want to rule out because it's treatable. <laughs> like There are things that we can do. And what I love about Dr. Jill's book is that it's very well laid out, easy to read, and it's very hopeful and gives you exactly what you need to do and the step functions because there is a process to the healing and you got to get the foundational part right before you can't just go straight at trying to attack the mold because you got to be ready for the fight, right? So you can go to drjillkrista.com and she has a great website. She has all kinds of courses that you could take if you're a professional. She has courses for professionals and she has courses for just everyone. And they're very helpful. And she also has a guided meditation that you might want to check out. So if you're still living in mold and you're working on the process of healing, that visualization recording could be very helpful for some for some people. So I hope you enjoy this episode as much as I enjoy talking with Dr. Jill. Dr. Jill, I'm so excited to have you on the show. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me. Thank you for having me on your podcast. It is a pleasure. So I love your book. Thank you. <laughs> it was so helpful to me when I was trying to figure out what was going on with my son and not one person mentioned, do you think it could be mold illness? Um, and so that was really helpful to me, but then also as my, my profession, I work with people that are chronically stressed and anxious and to right. really never once in all of my years of training, when we're talking about mood disorders, did anybody mention, Hey, rule out mold toxicity, right? <laughs> what about right. mast cell activation? <laughs> what about Lyme? You know, so I wanted to have you on. So the, I want to talk about your book and kind of what brought you to write the book and your background, and then kind of go into more of the mental health piece of this, if you don't mind. Yeah, no, I'd love to talk about the mental health piece because it is a, like you said, it's a massively missed aspect of, of this. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I ended up, um, I was working with mold sick patients, started in the Lyme world. Yes. And, um, yes. found that, you know, there's when I finally figured out, oh, this is Lyme got trained in Lyme, um, with the ILADS physician training program. And all of a sudden all the naturopathic principles made sense. Again, you find and treat the cause and people get better, except there's a group of people that stayed in this camp of chronic Lyme. Right. And in one of those, they found toxic black mold in his house when they were doing a remodel. And the, the inspector said, well, this has probably been here since they remodeled. So that was about a 10 year history. And I was like, wow, I wonder if this is why, you know, his gut is a mess. He's super anxious, can't sleep, has mm -hmm. urinary frequency, gut, you know, just skin stuff, always spraining ankles. You know, it was just like this, he would describe himself as a glass man because just everything would break if he just anything, you know, that, that sounds like mass cell activation. Now we have a word for that. 
Um, but back then we didn't, we didn't really understand other than, you know, oh, maybe he's allergic. Yeah. And uh, so when I went into the research, I was like, oh, this is definitely what's been going on. And I have been missing it because there's a lack of human studies. Mm -hmm. There's a ton of animal research though. I mean, animal husbandry and people who take care of animals, they have been on top of this for a very long time. They know the things you need to add to the feed. They have it all like how to preserve their, their stock, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I started, cause I have comfort with those tools. I didn't have to wait for a translational research study to say, okay, they used, you know, three milligrams per kilogram in a mouse. What does that mean in a human? I'm like probably pretty high dose fish oil. So I can go into my comfort zone there. Um, so yeah, it was just like years of doing in clinic live translational studies, which is not the ideal, uh, practicing on my patients, you know, I had a practice. Well, um, I think we have to, I mean, honestly, do, you know? when, when, before the science gets to us, I personally am not going to wait for right. 20 years for the science to catch up if it's going to help somebody. Like, and the thing is science will never catch up with this one because mm -hmm. they're known carcinogens. They're known like mold is these toxins that come from mold are known to be carcinogenic. They're known to cause birth defects. They're known to cause all of these, you know, gene changes. We can't create a study where we recruit people to say, Hey, who wants to get poisoned so we can figure out what makes you better. You know, right. medical ethics doesn't let us do that. So thankfully, you know, but um, we can do it on animals. That just doesn't make any sense, but right. we are doing it on animals and we're learning a lot. And so we will never have those clinical studies, those randomized controlled studies that we, that is the gold standard of medicine because we know they're poisonous. I mean, militaries are using these toxins as biowarfare. We already pretty much know what they do to bodies. We just don't know what to do to get the effects taken care of. Right. Um, and that's where, you know, then I was in this, this little, my little bubble of, you know, seeing kind of in the Lyme world, you know, once you get known as a person that can treat Lyme, then, you know, people come from all um, over the yeah. country <laughs> and then, and then you're like, oh no, now they're getting harder. I have to figure more tools out. And so, yeah, I just was digging in the research and applying it to humans and kind of created this little protocol that was working. And then we had mold happen in our own house. Right. And I, at the time, someone, one of my colleagues was like, you know, you should really make like a doctor class to teach us what you're doing with the mold. Cause then you get kind of known in the Lyme world as like, oh, she's seeing results. So let's figure out, you know, what this lady's doing. So as I'm creating a mold practitioner training course, I am living in mold, which is so funny. Just the, the way the universe is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Getting foggier and foggier and talking slower and slower on my videos. Like when I look back, I'm like, oh my God, I was so mold sick. Um, didn't know it was mold because that's what mold can do. And then we discovered that, you know, the flood kind of finally revealed itself. And I know I knew the inspector I loved. I knew the remediators that I loved because as I was going through this with my patients, I would go do home visits to learn what was going on because I didn't know. And I knew the protocol to put myself on and the different protocol my kids needed you know, just all of these things I had already in the hopper. And I thought, I don't need a training course for practitioners. I mean, I did need that. I really need to write a book. So everything went on hold with the training course and I wrote a book and I'd never thought of myself as an author. I just was, it just felt like a duty, you know, to like, this has got to get out. And it's so simple. It can be, the symptoms can be very scary and they can be quite severe but the treatment of it can be very elegantly simple when we use tools that address many, many, many mechanisms. And that's the stuff that I figured out in practice was like, I had, you know, hundreds of ideas from the animal research, but then what were the few things that did fed many birds with one seed, as they say, and um, just narrowed it down. And, you know, people say that about my book, like it's very simple. And it's made that way on purpose. I wrote it when I had brain fog and was mold sick. So I, I wanted to make sure I could understand it if I was in someone's situation. So I didn't need to prove to the other doctors that, you know, I knew big words or whatever that doesn't help anybody, you know? So I made it, you know, really dedicated myself to as simple as possible and keeping it light. You know, that, that was the other thing I learned. And as I was kind of in the Lyme world and the mold world is 
this is hard. People never get better. You know, I had this like heaviness to it and this trauma. Um, so I purposefully, yeah. like, you'll notice in my book, there's nothing, there are no pictures of mold. That's done very purposefully. My cover is all about the solutions and it's all very light and bright. And that is all, that was me just being very purposeful about how this is presented because it is really scary and heavy and affects your finances, your sanctuaries, your health, your family. People think you're crazy, your relationships, you know, all of this stuff gets affected. And I just wanted to bring lightness to the whole thing. Well, you did. The book is awesome. I mean, really user friendly. And, and I didn't even think about the fact that there aren't any pictures of mold, which makes perfect sense. Yeah, yeah it seems very thoughtful. I love the examples. I think they're really clear. It helped me as a practitioner, things that I need to look for when, particularly when people come with chronic anxiety and every tool I have isn't helping, right. you know, or goes it, backwards or goes backwards. Yeah. That's where we're like, oh yeah. And then you start yeah. to feel like a failure, but I'm um, the, the tools that I, the things that I need to look for, like, does somebody have a CPAP? as some something that I might not have normally asked athletes I want to know more about their equipment and what's going on in the gym that they're in all the time or they're wherever they're practicing what are their clothes all of those things but also as a mom like mm -hmm. these are the things that I started paying attention to I had never cleaned out the um, dishwasher I didn't know that you need to do stuff like that. I had to YouTube that sucker to figure out how to do it. And I, yeah, talk about gagging, but like all the places. Yeah. Yeah. But our laundry and, you know, I have a football player. So mm -hmm. with issues, like, come on. And, and pads. Yeah. After, after the, the example of the hockey player that I wrote in my book, yes. after he, I yes. figured out like they had moldy hockey pads and the whole locker room was moldy. And like, so we yes. had to work with the with the facility and all that kind of stuff. But I became, cause my kids were lacrosse players. Uh -huh. I was like, UV wands are going in your bag every night. We are just gonna, you know, do massive prevention. And I would, I was like the weird mom that I'd randomly stick cotton balls that had essential oils on them. And I would stick them in the bag. <laughs> They're like, mom, yeah. everybody says we smell like a hippie. Yeah. Oh, oh, <laughs> Buddhist hippie mom is what they call, oh, you and your Buddhist hippie stuff. I'm like, first of all, it's not Buddhist or hippie, but okay. Yeah, it's um, science, but yeah. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes, so I can relate to that. But I loved the examples. I thought it was great as a practitioner, as a mom, as somebody who's trying to figure out what could possibly be going on with my child. So what were some of the symptoms? Because you were living in the house, trying and rem yeah. you guys were rem remediating, I'm, I'm sure, but you stayed in the house. Did all the wrong things because <laughs> I thought, well, I know about mold. It's that thing like you can know the perfect diet um, and yeah. then somehow by osmosis, you're eating it, but you don't really have to follow. You know, it's this funny thing, like having the knowledge yeah. make can sometimes fake you into thinking that, you know, you don't have to do the work. But yeah, that was exactly it. I, I was like, yeah, I know, but my son got really sick and so we couldn't leave. And, he, you know, just all the pan stuff got layered really badly. And, um, it was just too much of a hassle to have to, to leave, but that's also like exactly what mold wants you to think. So yeah, we did all right. the wrong things, <laughs> but that's kind of rule. Number one is get out. Don't take anything or take mm -hmm. as little as possible, as little as possible. And we stayed and yeah, just yeah. Got sicker and sicker. And yeah. So I have a lot of compassion for people, but yeah, it's, yeah. A lot, I think a lot of brain fog. That's the other thing is like, I was so brain fogged and didn't know it. That's the problem. I know I get the client. This. And you know, it's just like, as I came out of it, I, I, again, I'm looking back at those videos and going, oh my gosh, I was so sick, you know, yeah. and just didn't even have self-awareness or insight into it. Anxiousness yeah. is really, really common. I don't think that yeah. I have had a mold sick patient that didn't have some level of anxiousness. Yes. And when there's a pandas pans diagnosis on top of that, the anxiety can be through the roof causing horrible insomnia. Um, yeah, it, it's really anxiousness is, it doesn't have to be bad, but mm -hmm. it is an aspect of almost all of my mold sick patients. And that I'm careful not to say anxiety. So in the mental health world, you know, when someone's talking about that, 
um, anxiety, I learned from my patient base that there's Mm -hmm. kind of this idea that anxiety is a diagnosis Mm -hmm. and that there's something wrong with them Uh and they need medication. So anxiety equals panic attacks kind of in a lot of these people's minds. And I realized, okay, if I, if I change the wording, you know, do you ever, do you feel unsettled Mm -hmm. inside? Do you ever feel anxious? Are you, you know, do you have Mm -hmm. worry that feels like it's a little, you know, I know you're going through a lot of stuff, but does your worry seem like a lot higher? Mm -hmm. Um, does your unsettled feeling ever interrupt your sleep? Does it ever interrupt your ability to kind of keep a, a constant thought process going for work? And so, you know, digging that out and then the language comes out of their mouth, which is like, I am so anxious all the time. Yes. And then it's like, okay, this is really calm with mold. And just to normalize that, like yeah. explain for people what's, why that is, is that yeah. there's a, there's a poison coming into their body right? that their lungs know, their sinuses knows it's communicating to their brain, but their thinking brain is going, where's the tiger? You know, cause we're kind of wired for right. handling stress that we can see and identify hear mm-hmm. all those kinds of things. So to mm-hmm. tell them like, it's really normal because your thinking brain can't see anything. You can't smell anything. A lot of times the building materials trapped behind, um, the mold is trapped behind the building materials. And so mm-hmm. until it becomes exposed to the air, you don't get that musty smell, but the mycotoxins, cause they're nanoparticles can move into the indoor airspace. They could just move right through tile grout, you know, drywall, um, anywhere where you have an outlet or a mm-hmm. can light or anything like that. Those are yeah. all places where we have air exchange and those mycotoxins can come right on in. So there's no smell, there's no sight, there's no hearing the tiger, there's no warning that makes sense to the thinking brain. Right. It's just, and so the thinking brain starts to tell the reptilian brain that is, you know, like our base brain, you know, like um, the survival part of our brain is saying, we're in trouble, we're in trouble, we're in trouble, we're in trouble, get out. And the thinking brain that says, I don't see anything. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Smell anything, you know, and I was completely, I'm, I'm like case number one for that, that I just kind of did the thing. It can't be that bad, you know, talk myself out of it. And we stayed during remediation, which we had a lot of cross-contamination and our remediation, even though I used people that I loved, it was just that. Well, mold is tricky. It's so so tricky. Every time we dug something, we found more. Yeah. It was just like, oh my gosh. And then when you start poking at it, it starts to make more toxin to defend itself. Right. Which makes sense. Yeah. And outside mold has a really important role. And I think it's, you know, we need it inside. Yeah. It's quite a mess. Not so good. That's right. Outside. It has a bunch of like, it's connected to nature and yes. you know, it's just like any human, yeah. like you spend too much time inside, you get disconnected from nature. That's where we get a lot of mental health issues too. It's just like not knowing yeah. where you fit, what's your purpose, you know, that kind of thing. So molds outside it's got all of the nature forces, the biggest one being the mycelial network that runs underneath all of our ground. You know, we have mycelium underneath everything. Mm-hmm. And that is the original internet. That's Indra's net, as they say in, in Buddhist. Actually, I in love, Taoist. Yeah. Ooh, I love so, that. Yeah. And uh, I love Paul Stamets. He's a mycologist and I'm just such a huge, huge super fan. He calls it the wood wide web. <laughs> Nice. I love it. Okay. Yeah. So like being connected like that, when mold is outside, it's got that supreme intelligence that it can tap into, you know, Mm -hmm. it has critters that drink extra water. It has air movement. It has sunlight and you come inside and we lose all those things. And so the mold can start to get, you know, act a little greedy, act a little unnatural. And uh, kind of like humans, kind <laughs> of like a reflection of, yeah, right. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, when we live too much indoors. Yeah. So I also got certified in quantum biology out of this whole experience. So we can talk a little bit about quantum biology. And, yeah. and I see your book behind you, both books behind you. We can yes. talk about that too. Yeah. But I wanted to see some people might not know much about mycotoxins. Do we want to just, Cause yeah, I th- absolutely. I think we went into that a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. So mold can make us sick with lots of different things. And, yeah. and if you look at the CDC 
kind of the standard conventional medicine idea of how mold makes us sick is through spores. So our interaction right. with the spores. Um, so you would, if you looked on the CDC website, they'd be describing what I call spore illness. Yeah. And that is like, you know, sinusitis, allergies, asthma, and then they go all the way down to the other end of the spectrum and talk about infection. So that's all spore stuff. Um, now there are lots of other ways that mold can make us sick, which is through molds chemicals, which is just basically off gassing. I, I joke that this is a uh, Martine Davis. She's my yeah. favorite inspector. She first introduced me to mold parts. Yeah. I was, was going like, to say they're oh mold parts, God. right? That's hilarious. <laughs> I was like, can I put that in my book? That's so funny. So, um, all cred to Martine. Um, so yeah, mold parts are basically they're metabolizing, they're off gassing. And one of those that we can test for is called mycophenolic acid, mm -hmm. it's not a mycotoxin. It's a off gassing of living mold. Why does that matter? Because if we're seeing it on a lab test, we know they're being exposed to living metabolizing mold. Mycotoxins are made on purpose by mold. They're a different animal. So mold will make mycotoxins to defend its territory. Mm -hmm. And they are intentionally made as a poison to another living human, living thing. And so we're not really the targets, but it does all the same things to our cellular structure as it does to the other fungus it's trying to compete out. Mycotoxins are really energetically expensive for the mold to make, so they won't necessarily always make them. So you can have a, a building that has really high MPA, but no mycotoxins. If it's a community of one species, which is very rare, Mm -hmm. Um, there'll be a lot of MPA, but not a lot of mycotoxins because they all love each other. They're all the right. same. They're not trying to fight. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Got it. So mycotoxins, they get my attention because of their intention is to harm, kill, destroy. Living yeah. Thing. Yeah. Right. right. So right. mycotoxins are fat soluble or oil soluble. If you want to think of it that way, I know a lot of people hear fat and they're like, what? can't hear that word. <laughs> So oil soluble, fat soluble, and that means that they, they can soak into body tissues in a different way than a lot of things can. They don't have to have an escort, a carrier protein, a transfer protein, nothing like that. They don't have to have le leaky gut, leaky brain, they're lipophilic. So they can just soak in by osmosis. They can go right into the membranes of cells mm -hmm. and then they move by a gradient. If there's enough of them, they'll shove the next one down, down the pike. And that's how we can get it in our brain through our olfactory nerve. Mm -hmm. um, I write about that in my pandas book. I have a little diagram in there that shows our olfactory nerve is one of the four places that our brain doesn't have a blood brain barrier, which for right. those of you in mental health, like that's a big focus of how do we yeah. get medication? Right. How do we get things delivered? Um, so there's no blood brain barrier. So if we're smelling a lot of mycotoxins, we smell by, by contact. We smell by those nerves touching a molecule. And that molecule is having an, a chemical reaction and communicates, you know, smell of roses, smell of, you know, whatever, like uh, food, like your favorite food, like pesto, <laughs> smell of baby diaper. Those are all things that are actually touching your nose nerve, which is kind of gross when you think about a baby diaper. You're like, what am I actually... I'm actually like taking that molecule in. That's gross. Yeah. But usually we have snot that's supposed to, you know, move all of that out, but mycotoxins will impair that protective mechanism so that they can move right up the olfactory nerve and right. that'll move by a gradient and go back into the brain. And the area of the brain that that gets delivered to is the limbic system. And that's right. our survival and safety system. Yeah. It's also our emotional part yep. of the brain where it's just, yep. Yep. So it makes a lot of sense that we see a lot um, of emotional disruption, people saying, I don't know, I'm weepy all the time. I can't quite get it together. Yeah. All those kinds of comments. Mm -hmm. And in, it can also be sweeps of emotion, sweeps right. of the mood. People will get really irritable or they'll get kind of giggly and silly and be like, I'm sorry, I'm laughing. I know this is really inappropriate and I shouldn't be laughing right now, but I, I can't control myself. That's brain inflammation. You know, right. so when you don't have right. reins on your emotions, no matter which way they are, but I don't know about you, like with the mold sick mm -hmm. patients, I'm seeing people go more toward the negative side, you know, more toward the sadness, despair, yes. you know, yeah. Irritability, yeah. acting out, raging, those kinds of things. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and seemingly for, they feel like it's just for no reason. Like it feels like it's out of the blue. 
Because right. it would make sense if you had certain stressors in your life that you would be irritable, but their, their lives are, are pretty good. <laughs> They're right. Right. You know, and they do not ever. And I, I was never trained to, to even think about mold as a possible issue. So, um, and I'm also yeah. a nutritional therapist. So we're trying to throw, you know, targeted supplementation, we're doing all the quantum health stuff. And so for me, when somebody is still urinating all the time, yeah, can't seem to shake this feeling of like, can't get it together. And then the emotional piece, and we're already addressing the emotions, really the psychosocial, emotional and spiritual that's mm -hmm. being addressed. The nutrient deficiencies are being addressed. A lot of the inflammation is getting better because of the quantum strategies, but they're still not getting better. I'm like, okay, this has got to be, this has got to be mold. It could be Lyme. It's something that I, we're not, we're not figuring out. Yeah. The yeah. whole, the whole, you know, toxicity, stealth, infection. Stealth. These things are stealth. Yeah. That's. Yeah. Yeah. And it, you know, we're probably scaring everybody. <laughs> oh, yeah. Don't worry. You <laughs> get news. Is, it's, no, it's good. You treat it. You yeah. Know, it's like that's the idea to identify it faster and get to the treatment faster so that we don't have as much cleanup crew that we have to send in and it doesn't take as much time. But the neurology is the, the slowest yeah. to heal in my experience. Like well, ear ringing. That's another big one. Ear oh, yeah. Ear ringing. Mm -hmm. That, yeah. Yeah, I had a totally different thought pattern for that until I read your book. <laughs> and I was like, oh, well, yep. okay, oh, there it goes. Another one. <laughs> right. But we don't know until we know. And that's what's exciting. And your book is very hopeful. So if people are like, I don't, I feel like maybe that might be the issue. You lay out exactly what people need to do, the layers that we need mm -hmm. to do. Because sometimes I think practitioners go straight in for trying targeted supplementation or trying to help people before you've done lay the foundation. Right. And you've right. got to lay a good foundation. Yes. Right. Yeah. That we've learned, I learned that from patients. I made people worse like, Oh, this is a fungal burden issue. Okay. Let's do antifungals and wham. Right. You no, know, they right. were not good. So the fifth, the fifth step of the way that I approach it is mm -hmm. save the antifungals, the antimicrobials, those kind of things for the last step, because yeah. there's a lot, like you said, a lot of, of, framework that we need to put into place so that the body can handle it. Mm -hmm. And then, then I found research studies that said, oh yeah, when you apply amphotericin B, which is a potent antifungal to aspergillus, its production of gliotoxin, its mycotoxin goes through the roof. And yeah. I was like, well, now, now I have a yeah. mechanism to explain how I crashed my patients. <laughs> so then I was like, okay, obviously we need to make sure that we have all the routes of protection and excretion, all of that, setting the stage for that um, increase. Yeah. Right. And if you're still in the mold, if you're still living in it and active, there are things you can do, which I've mm -hmm. learned to really help your nervous system. But you, you know, you're, you don't need to be trying to get rid of it in your body when you're still living in it. There's a tricky way to do that. I use a lot of, so I have a course called nine things to know while you're still in mold. And I purposefully didn't use the word stuck in mold. Right. Because you need to know why you're still in mold because that's, right. you know, we're not going to project that. Right. Um, and that, you know, I found that food-based herbs, yeah, the things that we eat all the time, like, mm -hmm. you know, sage, rosemary, cinnamon, oregano, I'm clove, a big... oregano. Yeah. Those are all things that you can actually take as supplements and yeah. it doesn't alarm the mold as much as something mm -hmm. like an antifungal would, because it's like, okay, we've seen this before. We kind of know this, you know, this, this oh, food so it doesn't freak it out. And so you can kind of keep yeah. a, keep a lid on, keep it tamped down because of the mechanism of action of those amazing plants and not alarm it. It just is like, boy, I'm having a hard time, you know, a spore. I'm having a hard time getting pregnant. I can't figure out why. It's because you're eating all of these amazing foods and you can take them as supplements too. Yeah. To kind of right. Supplement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which, but in, in the quantum health world, we always say redox before you detox. Mm -hmm. So I would always say that in being in right harmony yeah. with your natural environment is really a key piece. And I know that's important to you too. I know you just got interviewed by my friend, Catherine Clinton, 
right? Oh, yes. It's, she's, I love her. She's, she's amazing. So- Actually, when you said quantum biology, I, th- I was going to interrupt you and say, do you know Catherine Clinton? Of course I know Catherine. People. <laughs> Joa, she's amazing. You two re- remind me of each other. You're just oh, yeah. oh, similar. You. And That's a compliment. Yeah, yeah, you do. So yes, this whole idea of right place. So Catherine and I have talked about that on the podcast and on a live of like knowing your place. And mold knows its place outside, but sometimes personally, we have a hard time remembering who we are and what our place is in the natural yeah. realm. And, and then they, you invite yeah. a, a guest and we, you know, infect it with that disconnected thought process. Like I, I vilify mold a lot, which is really not fair because we're confusing it. You know, we're building these houses that are uber tight. They trap humidity. We have all kinds of previously living organic material. You know, like I've got wood cabinets, you know, it's just like, oh, well, my job is to decompose this stuff. So I'll get going, Mm -hmm. you know? And so I think we are really, it's, we've never had horizontal spaces you can't touch in a house until we had HVAC and duct work. Like that's a big Mm -hmm. problem. Right. I would love to invent some sort of duct thing where you, you know, you can open it up and clean it and then, you know, close it back up again. I think that that we need, we need a total redesign. It's totally our house designs, the way we're growing our food, you know, we're having to nail stuff like corn and, and wheat with antifungals because of the way that we poison them to, to desiccate them at the end so we can harvest them. And then they have to throw antifungals on them. It's just like, really not being fair to the microbes in our environment or in our bodies or in our bodies. <laughs> yes. Cause we are mostly like walking microbes. Um, yeah, there's yeah. more of them by cell count and DNA I, than there are of us. So I know. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. really, well, who are we? Right. Exactly. I know. Well, it's just a whole nother discussion. Yes. I am sure. <laughs> but yeah, but that's the thing is, and you know, you mentioned food. I was gung ho when I learned about the gut brain access and we are going to help people heal. And I was, I mean, and some people when they were already well and they added like fermented foods and the bone broth and all of these things, they would get so much better. And I'm like, look, but then there were a group of people that were getting worse. And I was fermented foods, fermented food, vinegar, like doing shots of apple cider vinegar all of these things that we thought were going to be so helpful for their brain, but they're actually, then their symptoms were getting worse. And, and it took me a while. Well, first of all, we just backed up because I think some practitioners will be like, Oh, it's a healing response. Go harder. I don't really, I think there is a fine line there. I do think that Mm -hmm. if it's lasting more than a couple of days and you aren't feeling better, what we're doing is I I think we got to back up. Like yep. you just, just back up, stop. Yep. Right. And then I found that there were people that needed a lot more healing before they could add those things, but I still never connected the mold piece. Yeah. So I have them stop eating peanuts and peanut butter. Cause I knew you can't really grow that stuff without mold. Right. But I didn't think about the other things like the fermented foods and the vinegar and, mm-hmm. and all the mast cell stuff and the, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And that's the thing. I learned that from my patients too. I mean, most of the stuff right. in the book is stuff I learned from working with patients. Cause I did the same thing. I'm like, you know, Oh, this is a microbiome problem. Let's get on the, let's yeah. get on the kombucha and yep. you know, yeah. they'd end up bloated and brain fogged and just dis- in despair, you know, and calling me with like, yep. I think I'm having suicidal thoughts. And I'm like, what's, what did we do? What did I just do? You know, I'm trying to figure it out. And it was basically, we just rolled the red carpet for the fungal overgrowth. You know, we were just like, here you go, more gliotoxin so that you can infect this person's gut better learning curve. So yeah, I do take a lot of heat on the kombucha because they're like, but that's good for you. And I'm like, not when you're not when you're sick, it's good for you for resilience. Correct. Um, Yeah. (laughs) Same thing for medicinal mushrooms. Like I do Yes. just like the diet, all of that, I consider a therapeutic window. It's just a window of time to give a rest to the, to the message that fungus is moving in, fungus is moving in, fungus is taking over, you know, that family. Mm -hmm. Um, so we do a therapeutic diet and I do for a therapeutic time, no medicinal mushrooms, no Saccharomyces boulardii. 
that's used a lot as a binder. That's in animal studies where they control their diets. Yeah. That's used a lot too in mental health. Mm -hmm. Yep. A lot of my patient population, it just, it just made them so much more, um, it, it hits the, the mind really yeah. badly. And then I found in the research that if you use that and someone has zearelanone, which is one of the mycotoxins from fusarium, uh-huh. um, that that can actually make the zearelanone more active. It keeps it in a reduced form. So that's just one I just take out because we have so many other options. Like why, why, why yeah. you know, find out that your patient was the one because they got sick, you know? So I just removed right. that. And then, you know, that's a therapeutic period of time. Mm-hmm. And then at the end, I use medicinal mushrooms for immune resilience because we right. do see that mycotoxins can really blow out the immunity. It can change our immunity at the gene level. Yep. Also at the epigenetic, meaning the soup that, you know, our genes are swimming in and being formed in. Um, so, you know, I'm just like, yeah, we need to now, if, if mold can change your genes to the negative, we can change it back. That yeah. means it's malleable. Right. That's what's and great about that. In that. our environment yeah. right now in the last three years, two years, there's mm-hmm. a lot of fear about genetic changes. And I just keep reminding people, I'm like, if something can change them means you have the power to change them back or even better. Yeah. Let's not express that Burka gene. Let's not, you know, let's do, let's make it better. I agree. And that's, that is the exciting part. Mm -hmm. Like, okay. And I know it's scary for people and I know it's Mm -hmm. so you go from practitioner to practitioner and, you know, trying to get answers. I get that. So I'm hoping that people will hear this and say, oh, there's hope. I'll know what I'm, what to rule out Mm -hmm. and that there's hope because there's so much that you can do to feel better. And that is the the great thing about epigenetics, right? It's the expression and lifestyle is a huge part of that. So yeah, it's really exciting. And even a layer beyond that, which you're doing in quantum biology is, you know, just Mm -hmm. belief systems and all, you know, Uh all that stuff that's at play Mm -hmm. that you could be doing the perfect things and still, you know, that can, that can be addressed. And actually the other way around, which is why I love to use it is by tapping into those powers that we have of, you know, engaging our light body, engaging our biology into that quantum area, then you don't have to be so perfect. Oh, right. That is, I love that part. (laughs) That is the freedom. Yeah, I know. Um, Then it's just, it's, uh, you know, sitting at the smorgasbord of life, you know, just like, oh, smell those, those, you know, flowers outside instead of like, oh no, I'm going to have an allergy attack. (laughs) So yeah, right. It lets you be part of being here. That's why we're all here, you know, to have this experience. Yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit more about like the elements and the quantum piece of our healing? Sure. I mean, I don't know that I'm speaking a language that everybody necessarily, you know, we could say yeah. believes in, right? Um, but I am trained as a shamanic practitioner and yeah. um, part of that training, I've been doing that for 20 years is just this concept that everything is energy. And that's where now quantum, they're they're tapping into that, that everything is energy and water is a carrier of a lot of that. And so right. by using, uh, you know, our waters and, and getting the energetics of our waters figured out, it gives you a lot more flexibility than on what you do of the matter part. Um, right. So, t- you know, tapping into that thing that everything is energy doesn't yeah. matter what your faith is. That doesn't take away people who, mm-hmm. you know, Christ is their savior or, you know, Buddha or those it's all, you can have all of that. And we're still working on the science level. You know, these are right. two things that can coexist. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. And I think like that, I didn't know if that's like, no, I love that. I, I didn't go. I didn't off. know about the shaman, the shaman mm. uh, practice of it. I, I love that. So, yeah. And I, one of the things that was really sort of shouldn't have been that shocking to me, but just to realize that we're electrical beings first. So everything is energy. Everything is frequency. Our thoughts have frequency. Our emotions have frequency. And that made a lot of sense in the mental health world because we were keep looking at like chemical reactions Mm -hmm. and mechanics. And I kept saying, we're missing something. We're missing something. (laughs) And then when I learned more about the quantum biology piece, 
I was like, well, of course we're electric and that's mo- it's so much faster. And so we much have, faster. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And this water, well, the water outside of us and the sunlight and all of these things that influence the inside, the mm-hmm. light we have inside and the water we make in our bodies. It's just, mm-hmm. it all makes so much more sense and it hasn't touched my spiritual beliefs I mean it fits right in right with, with yeah. everything I'm like oh okay this makes a lot of sense right totally. and you know when we stop to think about it you know I talk about EMFs in yeah. in my pandas book um these are things it's electro pollution it's things that we can't see yeah so it's a it's a lot in the mold world you know we can't see it we can't smell it we can't hear it but it is there we're aware of that. Like we're talking right now in two different places and this is going to go on the internet or it's going to go on your podcast, you know, wherever you listen to podcasts like that. We've, we've really like, we get that, but then we start talking about that in app, applying it to the body. Some people get real like, Whoa, wait a minute. It's like, wait, we do EKGs, right? We do echocardiograms. We do ultrasound. We do MRIs that's worked on magnetics. Like there's a ton in medicine that we're already doing in this field. Yeah. What we're just doing is taking it to a level of the same as going to a nanoparticle of, you know, like when people are starting to make zinc, that's more bioavailable and deliverable. And, you know, those are, those are chemical things. We're taking it into the nanoparticle. So we've expanded it by making it smaller. We're doing that on the electrical side. We're expanding our understanding by going into the smaller aspects of it. Right. Which makes, yeah. we've been doing that a long time. Long People time. do not have a problem with that. Like, oh yeah, of course that we've, but we've been doing that, I think for more diagnostically. And I think now what we're saying is, oh, we can be doing this from, for our optimal health. Like this could actually help us live healthier, better lives. So. Yeah. I- One of my favorite tools for that is frequency specific microcurrent. Oh. So if anyone's a practitioner listening, it's frequencyspecific.com. I think so. Dr. Carolyn McMakin is who uh-huh. you know, I learned from. Um, these little machines are magical, you know, and what they're doing is basically the concept of it that to simplify it is that each of our cells has its own unique beat, right? So our body is an orchestra and yep. it's all, when it's working well, it's this beautiful song and each cell has its own thing, sound, beat, frequency that it that it does when it's in health. And then when we impose a morbid influence onto that cell, which could be toxins, could be trauma, could be inflammation, could be, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, too many minerals, too little minerals, you know, you name it, yeah. all the yeah. things that can happen to a cell, um, infection. When we put that morbid influence, we can hear how the cell changes its sound. And this is all science. Um, this has all been proven, you know, in, in Germany, they did a lot of this, um, research. And so if you actually put the frequency through the cell that writes that cell, it can get it back on its beat. And we see increased ATP production, we see calcium channel, you know, channelopathy. So calcium channels open up again, and it's all about the art of it is picking which tissue are we dealing with? And what's the morbid influence? And so it will just run through patterns. There are other machines like Rife machine that does that too. Right. Rife for me is a little more, it, it's a wide band and then comes back this kind mm-hmm. of a thing where frequency specific microcurrent is very targeted, uh-huh. but that's the trick is that you have to know kind of what you kind of have to s- suppose what's going on. But I've also used it diagnostically. You know, the minute we hit the, the mark that uh, it was interesting before COVID hit, I had a lot of patients that were falling asleep at the nervous system protocol, inflammation of the nerves. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, wow, this is kind of an interesting pattern. Everyone's nerves are inflamed. Mm -hmm. And then we learn how like, you know, the spike protein is attaching to acetylcholine receptor, nicotinic receptors, you know, it's just, it's like, oh, okay. This is all making sense now, you know? So you can use these things diagnostically. And I think that really is the future of medicine is dealing on the frequency level. Well, yeah. I mean, come on. Mm-hmm. If I think that's, and it's just like magic when it, it works is. and it's, you know, having the right tool at the right place, the right time, just, yeah. and you get your life back. That's right. what's amazing. And rather and you can't still be in mold 
and have one of those and still and be healthy. Like we are still needing to do all the physical stuff. Right. But I think what we're talking about is like you do all the physical stuff and you have this other hack you could be you using have this tool. to get there faster. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And really, once you get your life, you know, you know, you, I have a lot of clients that come to me that their diet may be not fabulous, but it's pretty good, if not great. They are, they've already done therapy. They've done some trauma work, EMDR or some other stuff. They're doing all the pieces. So yeah. something like that can be really, they've already got the foundations there. Mm-hmm. And then to, to target like that, I just think I, I'm, it's pretty incredible that and especially for our kiddos I just think that the progression to this frequency type integrative medicine is really exciting because yeah. they're going to have a lot more at their disposal <laughs> yes. right yes exactly you know? and they're so ready for it I feel like that generation you know it's all intuitive oh, yeah, you yeah. Know, pick up a device they know what to do with it and they're unafraid and yeah so right like I know well amazing. and I kept thinking like I mean, I'm sorry that your family went through your own mold experience, but um, these things that happen, it, I'm grateful because it also, you wrote this book that's really helpful. You're helping so many people. And I kept having to remember that was the hardest part of my, my son being chronically ill is like, I kept having to say, I know this has some purpose. I am, I am certain that it's important for his path, my path. Mm-hmm. And hopefully we'll be able to help some other people once we're on the other side of this. Mm-hmm. But it was hard to keep that in my heart when Absolutely. you know you're desperate to to have yeah. Healing. And you're just seeing the suffering, and it's just like ugh, so hard on the heart. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so you all are healthy now. Everybody's good. Kids are good. We're working on it. We've got <laughs> one still who's limping along a little, but yeah, has ups and downs. And oh, that's right. Part of the, yep, part of the thing. <laughs> I want to just just mention that too because I think people think there's a place you get, <laughs> like right. there's a destination, and I was that way, right? I'm like I'm going up, and once you know, and it's this more cyclical experience mm-hmm. of healing. Yeah, I have a a picture in my book that I drew for so many patients. I was like, I'm just gonna yeah. top it out of one of their treatment plans and just put it in the book, just raw and real. Yeah. And, you know, it's like, here's how we want healing to work. And it's a straight up line, just like I'm doing all the right things. And so the benefit goes this mm-hmm. way. Right. And how it really works is this wiggle woggle, you know, like yeah. up, down, up, down. So the, the trend is going up, I but think- it's a lot of ups and downs and squiggles and things like that, that get you there. <laughs> yeah. I was just looking at that. Cause of course I've starred your whole book, but yeah, I'll, yeah, I yeah, have it I on Instagram. That. If anybody I'll pull it, it yeah. and put it up because it's, yeah, it's, it, it's true. It's a windy. Yeah. You can be doing all the right things and still have a downturn and that yeah. can be very confusing. And that's where as a practitioner, then, um, you go to the fundamentals, the theories, the, your mm-hmm. experience. Um, and for me, when I was early in practice, going back to Herring's laws of cure, which is based on homeopathy mm-hmm. was so helpful for me. And I talk about that a little bit in the book of like, if your mental health is getting better, but you are having diarrhea or you're breaking out in a rash or yeah. something is blowing up, pay attention to which of those two is more fundamental for your, your survival or your mental health, because that if you're going the way of something surfacey is blowing up, but the core, mm-hmm. like you're, you can sleep a little bit better. That's a healing path, even though it doesn't look like it. Cause you just, now your face blew up and you can't go to work mm-hmm. or something like that. You can be like, okay, great. You know, <laughs> great. <laughs> but actually when you right. stop to think about it, the way the body heals, it, it wants to pull, push things from the deep to the surface. So it'll push out of bone marrow. It'll push out of brain. It'll push all of these things out to protect the most vital aspects of our, of what is making us tick, which is a lot of it is the brainstem brain. Mm-hmm. And I, I think it's really helpful for people to understand that too, as things come erupt, mm-hmm. but also to know that if I, my philosophy is the body is always working in our favor. It is always in our corner. It's trying to communicate or heal itself. 
And mm-hmm. once you have symptoms, you've already moved into the healing phase. Mm-hmm. Like your body has are is already doing what it feels like it needs to do to either yeah. get your attention or heal itself. Yeah. Or really yeah, to keep you alive, right? Survival. Really to keep you alive. <laughs> right. It's really alive and limping, maybe, but you know, alive and but alive. Yeah. That's hard to 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 remember when you, it feels like your body's working against you. Like, yeah. Why does my body hate me? You know, I hear kids yeah. say that a lot and it's like, it's doing the best it can. And we need to listen to what it's asking for. Yes. Um, and that really is very instructive for us, you know, cause once it goes into that cell danger response, right. That yeah. is a whole other level of like, we could be pushing the body to do something. And it's like, no, 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 no. Don't give me more of that nutrient. It's going to feed the bug, you know, kind of like we saw with the the fermented foods, like, right? Okay. The gut microbiome that we were saving people <laughs> and then making them worse. Yeah. Uh, whoops. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, but we learn, and I, you we know, learn. Mm-hmm. And, and people we, need to like trust your body. You do not need trust. an intercessor. Yes. We're here for information, but you know your body better than anything. Yes. And if someone is recommending something, you know, especially if you're a super sensitive person, do one thing at a time because that is just it's good science for starters, you know, right. that gets a lot more clear. Yeah. Um, and sometimes there's a synergy of things. Like sometimes you do need CoQ10 with the melatonin, or you do need N-acetylcysteine or alpha lipoic acid with the bioflavonoids to where you're feeling like, well, it's doing something. So if you have just started something and you don't see any benefit, you wait until you add that next thing your doctor's recommended, because sometimes there's synergy. But on the converse or the flip side is if you've started something and you're having a bad reaction, like you said, I I have a section in my book, if it's too hard, it's too hard. And what that means too hard means your, your body is doing the best it can. And we're overwhelming its detox capacity. We're overwhelming its ability to handle this. A HERC should be done in 24 to 48 hours. Mm -hmm. If it's past that, we're pushing too hard. And the number one thing is Right. Reel back on the last thing that we added because that's probably the thing that's pushing over. It's yeah. very simple. Yeah. <laughs> or stop it. <laughs> right. Right. And just, holiday. Right. Mm-hmm. And really trust your body. Mm-hmm. Listen to your body. And that can be really difficult when you've spent years feeling like you're fighting with your body. Right. Yes. Yeah. So. Right. Yeah. Kindness, tenderness, grace. Yeah. All, all the things we could use a lot more of. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So, I, I wanted to ask you if there's anything that we feel like you wanted to share, like what's lighting you up these days? Is there anything that's really nourishing to your body, mind, soul that you wanted mm. to share? It doesn't ever change. It's getting outside, <laughs> it's just being outside. You know, I'm, I'm passionate about water and have been forever using hydrotherapy, the mm-hmm. application of hot and cold water to the body. Um, when we talk about, you know, kindness and tenderness to the body, you know, sometimes just a bath, you know, it's just, Mm -hmm. some of these things can be so easy and so healing. So, but for me personally, it still Mm -hmm. is getting outside, you know, that's, yeah, yeah. it's like my base vitamin. If I don't get it, Mm -hmm. I'll, yeah. So if anyone ever wants to torture Jill, just put me inside. Oh no, (laughs) nobody ever torture. I lose it. But yeah. And I right. think that's really important for everybody. Like get outside. outside, get outside. I know I, yeah. And it seems way too simple, but everyone I've ever talked to has agreed that there's something really important about nature. And I, like it gives your body, it's sending safety signals to your cells. Like nature mm-hmm. is really important for our- don't, like people push back in the city. They're like, Oh, you know, so I'm not going to get better if I can't get to the woods. And I'm no, no, no. That's not what I'm talking about. Outside <laughs> gaze at the sky, you yeah. know, at just being outside, engage with the air. Yeah. There's so much, yeah. there's so much healing available and you know, our planet loves us. So, you know, it's easiest to feel that love. If you can get your bare feet on the ground. Exactly. I was like, well, we didn't talk about earthing, but yeah, yeah. but Concrete. you know, I also live where it gets yeah. very, um, it gets very cold where I live. So bare feet on the ground in the winter is just kind of a lot to ask. So you know. yeah. Yeah. But, Maybe you know. a pinky on a tree, but mm-hmm. yeah. yeah, exactly. There are other ways to engage, but truly the outside is the outside. It's, again, as simple as it gets, there's no drug company going to be doing ads for that. Right. That doesn't mean it's not important. 
That's true. That's absolutely true. Well, I knew I would love having you on the show. I knew I would enjoy getting to know you a little bit. And of course I have. So it's just, it's been such a pleasure. And I just hope that people can hear the hope. And if they're having issues, I mean, you put so much information out on Instagram for free and your book is great. It's just a great resource. So whether somebody is a practitioner or they are somebody that's struggling with feeling good, want to rule out mold. I think yeah. that's, yeah. And the book is really written for regular people. I do have a training yes. course for practitioners. That's a lot. Oh, more. you did get that done, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I have a, it's a 10 hour course. It's a lot and you can become mold literate certified and if they're yeah. primary care doctor, um, and then you kind of, you have the the base of what to do for the sensitive people. So that's, that's available great. and everyone's listening and they're like, I wonder if this is a thing for me. We didn't really go through the, the litany of symptoms, but they can get my questionnaire off the website. Um, yes. And that's a great way to test. You don't have to have the book or anything like that. You can just test yourself and get your score. Oh, that's a good point. Right. Yeah. Cause we kind of touched on the symptoms as we were going, but not, yeah. it's a long list. People. It's a long <laughs> list. That's why it's really, you know, like ooh, it's a cluster and each mycotoxin sort of does its special sauce. So mm-hmm. it could be, could look very, and actually is more normal to look different in each person. Um, because yeah. of that, because of genetics and because each mycotoxin has its own thing that it does. So, yeah. So if anyone wants right. a questionnaire, that's on my website, drkrista.com. Yeah. And I think it might be helpful for people. If you have multiple systems firing up symptoms, I think it's probably important to just rule out mold. <laughs> and mold. if you've done everything oh, that makes sense yes. and your doctor is still scratching their head, yeah, that's a mold lime parasite, you know, I know like we the, didn't those even kind of self-infection <laughs> kind of things like, and yeah. you know, usually mold is behind it because it's lowering the immune system. So that's right. the key, yeah. the yeah. center of the wheel. And then there's a lot of spokes that go out from there. Yeah. And what was really alerting me was that my son was having both nervous system and immune system reactions. And I kept mm-hmm. saying, well, the mast cells are literally the bridge between those two systems. So wouldn't it make sense, even if you don't have mast cell activation syndrome or they've ruled that out, I was like, but it has to be a mast cell. This, this has to be an activation. So Mm -hmm. yeah, there's an, there's a level of activation before it becomes the syndrome. Yeah. We don't have any great way to test for it. We don't, which is, I'm just, mm, that's all. Yeah. 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 But there are ways to heal and um my kiddo is doing great and good. I was um, gonna ask that after we got off because I wasn't sure if you wanted to talk about yeah. it. Yeah, good. We're exactly. we're getting there. I mean it's a process, right? Yep. Yeah. yeah. So we're we're in that squiggly <laughs> squiggly line somewhere. And so. that's where, you know, I think you asked about my um the things is getting outside, but also comedy. Like I love oh, to yeah. laugh. I love Laughter is people and yep. yeah. so good for our stress. It's so, so good for good stress for management. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. And you know, laugh at whatever, like whatever makes you laugh at you yeah. don't judge it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Laugh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I agree. Well, thank yeah. you so much. Thank you. And so great to have you on. Nice chat. And I'm so excited to hear more about your quantum biology and what you're, what you're bringing to this space. It's really cool. Oh, I'm excited. It's it's the most exciting thing I've come across in a long time. So yeah, thanks.